Hello, what a wonderful turnout. I'd like to welcome you to the third Longwood Seminar of 2018, Bridging East and West, New Frontiers in Medicine. I'm Gina Vild, I'm the Associate Dean for Communications and External Relations for Harvard Medical School. And in addition to welcoming those of you who are here in the auditorium with us tonight, I'd like to welcome our live stream viewers. As you know, if you've attended past seminars, we invite viewers from around the world to join us. And our first two seminars of 2018 were viewed by 46,000 people around the world, including countries Brazil, Japan, Turkey, Australia, South Korea, Morocco, and Ireland, just to name a few. And we will be taking questions from our live stream viewers as well as, as questions from our audience. If you happen to miss these, have missed these first two seminars, we invite you to go to the Harvard Medical School website and look up the Longwood Seminars, and there you will find this year's seminars and many seminars from past years. And many of the topics are evergreen, so I think you'll really enjoy it. I invite you also to join us for our final seminar of 2018. It's on May 9th, Weighing the Facts of Obesity. So by dint of the fact that you're here with us tonight, we know you have an interest in the varied, varied approaches to medicine and healing. So I invite you to access even more of our Harvard Medical School resources by visiting www.health.harvard.edu. That's www.health.harvard.edu, where you will find a wealth of interesting health information on a host of topics, ranging from pain relief to stretching to Tai Chi. In fact, on the site, you'll find a special re health report edited by Dr. Peter Wayne, who is one of tonight's speakers. So, as we always do, a few brief announcements. On the screen, you will see information on receiving certificates of completion for those who have attended three or more of the year seminars. And also, if you're a teacher and have attended all four, you will receive professional development points. Our speakers will be taking your questions at the end of their presentation, so we invite you to jot them down on the index cards you were given when you registered. And our members of our team will be walking up and down the aisle. You can pass your questions to them. And if you are watching through the live stream, we ask you to please write your question into the comments section of our Facebook page or our YouTube page. And we will get to as many of the questions as possible. We also invite you to, to join our Twitter conversation using hashtag HMS Minimed, hashtag HMS Minimed. Now for this evening's program, Bridging East and West, New Frontiers in Medicine. There's burgeoning interest in Eastern medicine. You are not alone. In fact, a search on Amazon, I did this today, reveals 30,000 search results on complementary medicine and 100,000 search results on alternative medicine. According to recent studies from the National Institutes of Health, and I've seen varied statistics, but most would agree that at least a third of American adults are opting for healthcare methods that are outside of what we consider Western or conventional medicine. But what do we really know about the effectiveness of these therapies, used either alone or in conjunction with Western medicine? Can Eastern medicine influence our treatment outcomes? Can natural products such as herbs or techniques including acupuncture and Tai Chi work together with medications to help us manage pain or other chronic conditions? And can we use insights from all that we know, from all healing traditions, to better treat our ailments? These questions will be addressed tonight by some of Harvard Medical School's leading researchers, and we're really delighted to have them with us. So I'm pleased to welcome our panel of experts who are looking forward to sharing their knowledge about health and wellness with all of you. Dr. Timothy Mitchinson is the Hasib Sabah Professor of Systems Biology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Peter Wayne is an Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. 
and research director of the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine and founder and director of the Tree of Life Tai Chi Center. And one of his special reports was on the table in the lobby. Our moderator, Elan Lanchvan, is the Bernard Osher Professor in Residence of Complementary and Integrative Medical Therapies at Harvard Medical School and the Director of the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine for Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospitals. Please join me in welcoming our special guest tonight. Thank you. Good evening. Is my microphone on? Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Gina. This is really such a pleasure to be here. And uh, we're going to be talking about some very sort of interesting topics that uh, in, at the OSHA Center, we fall under the umbrella of what we call integrative medicine. And is this going to advance? I need the slides, please. OK. <laughs> so sure. I'm a little bit of an issue here. So when we think about integrative medicine, we Thank you. We usually think about bringing uh, conventional medicine and what we call alternative medicine together. And uh, alternative medicine, we usually think about it, these are the types of uh, treatments that don't usually get taught in medical school. And although that's starting to change, uh, there's more and more integration of these different other types of traditional healing uh, practices in medical schools. But we think that it actually goes beyond that, in that integrative medicine is really at arriving at, at a deeper understanding of the human body that underlies both complementary and conventional medicine. So we also uh, pay a lot of attention to not only understanding the treatments, but understanding the underlying pathology and even the normal physiology that without a, a real understanding of how the body works, it's difficult to uh, do research on how a treatment might work. And what we believe is that traditional healing practices, such as traditional Chinese medicine and other oriental healing uh, practices, can really inform our understanding, a fundamental understanding of the body, and that can help us uh, derive new and, and more effective treatments. So the three talks today, uh, the first one I'm going to be talking about acupuncture and how the uh, insights derived from acupuncture can help us understanding a very sort of uh, a, a part of the body that we don't usually pay much attention to, which is the connective tissue. After that, uh, Dr. Tim Mitchison is going to be talking about how the study of traditional Chinese herbs can be uh, used as a way to uh, deepen our, our understanding of pharmacology. And finally, Dr. Peter Wayne is going to be talking about how the study of Tai Chi can uh, inform our understanding of the connections between the mind and the body. So talking about acupuncture, I've, talk, I'm, I've entitled my talk, Reconnecting the Body, Insights from Acupuncture, because in conventional medicine, one of the things that I think, one of the strengths, as well as the, one of the weaknesses of our conventional medicine is that the body is sort of broken down into different uh, segments. For example, um, we we think of the body as a, as a different physiological systems. And this dates back to the very beginning of what we call, think of modern medicine at the, in the 19th century. 
There was the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, the digestive system. And these, this, this separation of the body into these different systems has carried over into our medical specialties, right? Cardiology, pulmonary, et cetera, but also into our academic departments. We do research very much system, one system at a time. But this is something that patients complain about. They, a lot of times you go to the doctor and people complain. It's like I'm treated like I'm just a bunch of disconnected body parts. Now, traditional Chinese medicine takes a different view of the body. It thinks of the body as an interconnected whole. And an example of how the traditional Chinese medicine thinks that way is that there is a set of, oops, I'm sorry. This is the wrong thing of meridians that they call. These are sort of, they call, they're, they're these sort of longitudinal lines that sort of go around the body and up and down and connect everything with everything else. That's how acupuncture uh, practitioners think of these meridians. Now, earlier on, when I used to be at the University of Vermont, um, we did a study where we looked at these acupuncture meridians using ultrasound. And what we found is that acupuncture meridians, when, we, when you look at the body using ultrasound, so here's an example. Here, when we do um, ultrasound, you first you see the surface of the skin, then you see the subcutaneous tissue here, and then we see here muscles, and this white stuff is the connective tissue that separates the muscles. And what we noticed is that a lot of the acupuncture points were located in, in between muscles, where you can see planes of connective tissue. And when you look at a series of different uh, cadaver slices and you map these acupuncture points, you can see that over 80% of them is located in between two muscles. So this made us wonder whether there might be a connection between acupuncture meridians and connective tissue. It turns out that a serendipitous observation was that when you insert an acupuncture needle, you don't just insert it. You also rotate it and manipulate it. And what acupuncturists feel is that the, there's a kind of a, a, a sensation that the acupuncturist feels like the tissues are grabbing the needle. And um, there was no physiological explanation for that uh, when I went to acupuncture school many, many years ago. And um, the, the common belief was that this was due to a muscle contracting. But when we did a little bit of, of, of experiments in the lab, we found that, in fact, this grabbing is due to co connective tissue, collagen fibers underneath the skin in the subcutaneous tissue that wind around the needle, a little bit like spaghetti around a fork, and tighten. And that's what causes this sensation. One of the earliest experiments that we did is we designed a robotic machine like this that actually inserted the acupuncture needle mechanically, rotated the needle either all in one, in one direction, what we called unidirectional, or back and forth, bidirectional, or no rotation. And we measured how much force it took to pull the needle out because we figured this might be a, an interesting way to quantify this phenomenon that you can feel with your hands. And what we found is, indeed, as you rotate the needle, you get more, it takes more force to put the needle. So in fact, this corroborated the fact that there, there is a change in the interaction between the needle and the tissue. The other thing we did is we compared acupuncture points compared with non-acupuncture points and found that there was a difference. It was statistically significant, even though it was only a small difference, 20%. But on average, you had more of this pulling force at acupuncture points. So we also looked using ultrasound directly down at, this is a high frequency ultrasound. We're now we're looking down on the tissue and here's the needle in the center. And you can see that when the, when the needle is rotated, the tissue winds around the needle like a whirl. Now, this is interesting because we wonder, started wondering, well, what happens to the tissues in response to this? And very recently in the news, um, I don't know if you, some of you, probably some of you have heard of this new organ uh, paper that a lot of, that made the sensation about uh, three weeks ago or so in the news. Well, they were claiming that they said, it turned out it was not a new organ that they discovered, but they did make an interesting new observation about what they call the interstitium, which is the tissue right underneath the skin. 
And what they found using a special camera is that this interstitium is, is structured very much like, like kind of like a sponge, where there's, there's these kind of little honeycomb structure filled with fluid. And every time you move or you twist or you turn your, your, say, your wrist, this distributes the fluid underneath the skin. Well, guess what? The same thing happens during acupuncture. And this is very similar. You can see that the pictures that they took are very similar to our ultrasound pictures that we took you know, quite a while ago. But this is, this is interesting because it really draws a parallel between what they describe as this interstitium and the, uh, the, 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 the phenomenon of acupuncture. So why is this important? Well, um, this is because every time you move, the connective tissue slips and slides and moves. So I'm going to play you a movie. This is a, somebody who is lying down on a table, and the ta this is a, a, a chiropractic table that, that bends like this. So essentially, the person is lying, and their body is being bent back and forth. And here is an example of how you can see here this white line is what we call the thoracolumbar fascia. This is a thick layer of connective tissue in the back. And, the, and you can see that, uh, hopefully you can appreciate that these layers are slipping and sliding past one another, and they're also stretching. So every time you move, your connective tissue is being sort of massaged from the inside. And you can imagine this, if this connective tissue is actually like a sponge, the liquid is being squished and squeezed and pulled and moved around. So this is an interesting, I think, kind of uh, way to think about connective tissue as, and the role that it might play. So the important thing to think about also is that connective tissue literally goes everywhere in the body. You could draw a line from any point of your body to any other point of your body via a path of connective tissue. And so it surrounds every muscle, every, every nerve, every blood vessel, and, and it goes inside the organs as well. And that's what acupuncture, when they describe acupuncture meridians, that's how they describe them, exactly. Connecting the organs with the periphery, connecting the superficial with the deep, connecting the inside with the outside. And so what we think is that there are, it, we don't, we're not saying it's the same thing, that acupuncture is the same, meridians are the same thing as connective tissue, but th there could be, one could be kind of like a representation of the other. In my lab, we're really interested in a connection between the musculoskeletal system and the immune system because, interestingly enough, connective tissue is part of both. It's part of the musculoskeletal system because just as I was explaining, muscle connective tissue goes around the muscle and a lot of the force that the muscle exerts actually goes to the connective tissue and gets transmitted to the other tissues next to it. It also, the connective tissue is also a place where a lot of immune responses take place. When immune cells circulate throughout the body, they go around sort of looking for trouble. And what they do is they go from the blood out into what we call the extracellular space or the interstitium, well, guess what? That's the connective tissue. That's where they go. So a lot of responses like inflammation, for example, happen right in connective tissue. So what we wonder is, can the mechanical forces within the connective tissues, at, when you move around every day, does that influence the immune responses that are going on in the connective tissue, such as inflammation and even cancer? So the, the effect of stretching on acute inflammation, we studied that using a, an animal model where we induce the animal to stretch by simply lifting it gently by the tail. And I had a student in my lab who did a lot of yoga, and she was interested to see whether we could do a little bit of sort of like, like rat yoga. And so it, it turns out you can. If you, if you lift the mouse very gently by the tail and you let it grab onto something, what it does is it stretches its front feet and back feet. And it, it can hold this position for several minutes. And then you can look and see whether there is an effect. And we induce a small amount of inflammation on the back of the animal, on the thoracolumbar fascia, which is that same fascia I was showing you that moves back and forth. And you can see that stretching reduces the inflammation uh, by quite a bit. Uh, and so stretching has an anti-inflammatory effect. Now, how could that be? Well, we're, we are, um, 
we are very interested in the mechanisms by which inflammation turns itself off. Inflammation is a very important uh, response of the body. If you didn't have inflammation, you would never be able to heal a wound, right? But once the wound is healed, inflammation has to stop because ongoing inflammation is not good. And one, one of the mechanisms that was discovered, this is uh, by uh, the, Dr. Charlie Surhan here at the Brigham some time ago, is that there is a resolution. These are a uh, phase of inflammation that is governed by some molecules that are actually uh, derived from dietary omega-3 fatty acids. These are uh, what is in the fish oil that we are very, uh, we are recommended to eat, uh, to, to take on as a dietary supplement or simply in fish if that's part of our diet. And so these uh, fatty acids turn, our body makes these what we call pro-resolvent mediators that helps turn off inflammation. If on the other hand, this does not happen and pro-inflammatory mediators dominate, then you become, you, you t it, this turns into chronic inflammation which can then result in fibrosis. Now, what we found is that stretching actually activates the pro-resolution mechanisms within connective tissue. So uh, we found that stretching the animal does the same effect of in, as injecting the resolvin, which is the pro-resolving mediator, if you compare the effect of stretching without the injection to uh, stretching, uh, to no stretching with the mediator, they both reduce inflammation compared to no stretching. And we also looked at the production of this pro-resolving mediator in the tissues in response to stretch. So you can see that the connective tissue is making its own resolvin uh, in response to stretching. So that really suggests that this is really a natural mechanism that happens. So in, in summary, um, I think that what I was suggesting is that we can take hints from traditional Chinese medicine from this concept of acupuncture meridians, which really seems very sort of foreign and difficult to understand. But when we start thinking about the relationship of meridians to connective tissue, it starts to make more sense. When we further look at the mechanical effect of acupuncture needles, when you, the, the tissue is rotated, and in fact, when you, it's almost like stretching the tissue from the inside. And what we think about in our lab is acupuncture needles as being sort of little micro-manipulators. And, and, and it's it used to, to insert the needle and then do a very, very targeted little mini stretching around the needle. But we also know that there are other ways of stretching tissues. You can stretch tissues using your hands, like in massage, for example. You can stretch your tissues doing yoga or tai chi. And so these various ways of stretching tissues, we think, have common mechanisms of action at the level of connective tissue. So I think what we're going to see in the, in the next uh, two talks is more examples of how observations and uh, insights derived from other uh, healing uh, practices and other healing traditions can really uh, influence and enrich our basic fundamental understanding uh, of the body. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Tim Mitchison, and I'm going to have my camera now. Thank you. That's great. That's all the whole See, whoops. <laughs> okay. And why is it not switching over? I don't know. Let's see, this is yours, right? Having difficulty switching the presentations, maybe they needed to do it. Okay, I'm gonna take this. So same. Okay, so now where is yours? There we go. Okay, and now we're gonna go slideshow. All right, good evening. Uh,
very nice to be here. This is a wonderfully diverse audience compared to uh, audiences I, I, I'm usually uh, talking to. So I, I see uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, different kinds of people and lots of more young people than perhaps I was expecting. Uh, I, I dare say that uh, a lot of the young people in the audience are here because uh, they want to become doctors and uh, that's a great ambition in life. But let me recommend to you guys being a scientist instead. It's much more fun. <laughs> and it's also, uh, you're, you're pretty much guaranteed a job if you're becoming a scientist, so it's quite uh, e economically uh, fine as well. So, and if anyone would, uh, doesn't know about being a scientist and would like to uh, learn what you could do with a PhD, for example, uh, uh, please email me. I'd be uh, happy to talk about it. <laughs> So I, I want to talk a bit about uh, 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 herbal medicines, uh, um, and I'll, more a Western herbal medicine actually than Eastern, but, but I think the, the philosophy is similar. Um, I'd like to make a couple of disclaimers first. Uh, one is uh, I don't have any uh, financial uh, conflict of interest or anything. We're, we're supposed to do that at Harvard. The other is um, if you're interested in herbal medicines and, and are considering taking a herbal medicine or, or, or are taking one, I'd like to make a couple of points. Uh, uh, some people think because something is sort of natural or from the wild environment, it's safe, and that simply isn't the case. Uh, some of the most potent poisons we know of are made by plants and microorganisms, so you, you have to be really careful, and the medicines I'm going to talk about are actually deadly poisons. Um, they're only safe if taken in very limited quantities as, as medicines. And, and secondarily, if you are taking uh, 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 herbal medicines, you should definitely tell your Western doctor about it. There are some herbal medicines that are quite safe on their own, but they can interact with Western medicines, affect their metabolism, and you can get drug-drug interaction. So it's, it's really important that your uh, Western practitioner know about it as well. And I'm, uh, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a healer. I'm a biochemist, actually. I, I, I've sort of been a biochemist my whole life. I, conceive that enthusiasm in, in, in college. And um, to me, a, a human being is a sort of ultimate uh, biochemical black box. When I, I look at you guys, I see systems of molecules interacting. That's just the, <laughs> the way I grew up. And, and so I, 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 I think you'll, you'll see through this talk, I, although I'm really interested in, in healing and you know, I, I, for my own body, my family, etc. I, I do uh, sort of uh, approach these problems sort of thinking about it uh, uh, as a chemist very much. Um, and I, as a, a biochemist, I'm, I'm very interested in drugs, uh, uh, medicines uh, that you eat or that are injected, molecules uh, that we uh, take into our body hoping for therapeutic effect. And you know, broadly speaking, if we take a drug, we hope to go from sick to well. And the sorts of questions that, that interest me that, that we research in my group and, and, and that I teach as well is questions like how can we develop drugs for diseases we cannot treat at all at the moment. For example, there's enormous interest in developing drugs for neurodegenerative diseases, diseases like Alzheimer's and ALS where we really don't have any treatments at the moment. How can we improve drugs we already have for, for treatable diseases or partly treatable diseases? And then I think a really crucial problem in modern pharmacology is how can we personalize treatment? How can we treat individual patients, not treat people as statistics, but, but figure out what really works for individuals? And so these are kind of the themes in, in modern uh, uh, Western medicine, I would say. And um, like I say, I am very interested in drug discovery. And I don't know how many of you guys know this, but, but Boston has become, or the Boston-Cambridge area has actually become essentially the world mecca for drug discovery these days. Um, used to be New Jersey and, and, and the Bay Area in, in California, but uh, uh, half of the drug discovery in the world has moved to Boston in the last few years, and Cambridge particularly to take advantage of all the great universities uh, uh, and, and, and medical schools around here. And so I have more and more colleagues who uh, are scientists like me, but they work in, you know, in Biogen or Novartis or someplace um, trying to develop new treatments. And if you look at modern drug discovery going on in Boston in a very Western uh, 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 manner, so we're trying to develop new drugs. The, the, the modern emphasis is to figure out the molecular basis of disease, and, and human genetics has been particularly important, uh, new sets of insights into that. 
to identify what we call targets, which are molecules that are naturally in our body that there's too much of or too little of or they're defective in some way that we've figured out uh, uh, molecularly. And then to use these targets, which are very often proteins, uh, and to develop drugs that bind to them and, 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 and improve their properties in some ways. And, and this, this sort of modern version of drug discovery, if I was to ask to name some examples, I think, for example, antiviral drugs for, for HIV in the 1990s. I, I lived in San Francisco in the 1990s, and I watched as AIDS, HIV came and killed a lot of people, and then these amazing drugs were developed, and now it's become a manageable chronic disease. And then more recently, uh, some beautiful new antivirals for hepatitis. So people figured out the viral proteins, that the virus needed to replicate, and they developed uh, small molecules that stuck to those proteins and, and poisoned them, and those, those were treatments. And this is by far the main, you know, all these uh, 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 drug discovery companies, actually there's one, Merck is just a stone's throw from here, one of those nice glass buildings, and over in Cambridge, this is the main approach. But there is a, a I call it here, a neoclassical approach, but you sort of, combining, uh, uh, starting from a more traditional treatment and sort of reverse engineering it. And I would say until the genetic revolution, which started in the 1980s, uh, this is the main way Western, Western medicines were discovered. Uh, now, now, after the genetic revolution, uh, this is much less used in the West, but I think it still has a, a lot of potential. So if you know of some traditional treatment, uh, I'm talking now about uh, a drug, so, so a herb or a plant material or something that, that, that people have eaten uh, uh, or, or otherwise been administered to treat a disease, you could try and figure out the molecular and uh, physiological basis of the treatment now, reverse engineer the treatment, and then from there try to develop uh, a, a new treatment. And this has a distinguished history, uh, for example, and I think you, you heard a, a seminar in this series about, uh, about opioids, but modern surgical anesthetics derive from uh, morphine, which is one of the most ancient drugs, the natural product of poppies, was well known in the ancient world um, as, a, as a treatment of pain. It, actually, the plant-derived natural product is still used. It's very important. Uh, pain medicine still, particularly in, in, in uh, terminally ill patients, but there, we've developed a lot of molecules based on this that are tuned for, uh, for example, surgical applications. So this, you know, and I actually don't know exactly when morphine was isolated, um, but that was an important molecular step forward there. And whether you're taught whatever the route that a, a molecule was discovered, I, I think I, I'm actually a professor of systems biology, and I, I sort of view the human body as, 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 as the ultimate system to study. But in drugs, we're looking to make a perturbation at the molecular level. These are crystal structures of proteins. These are G-protein coupled receptors with a, 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 a drug bound to it. And we're looking for a molecular level, something perturbation at the molecular level to do something good at, at the whole body level. And um, I think if you're not trained as a, a molecular biologist, you might look at a, a protein molecule and think, oh, that's very complicated, and the human body sort of being sick or being well seems perhaps simpler. But, but nothing could be further the truth. Actually, molecules in their own way are, are, are really quite simple. You can describe them precisely, whereas the human body is immensely complex, as Helen uh, was telling you about uh, some, some parts that people don't usually think about as much. Um, and I, I think when we eat a medicine and it gets into our body and binds to a protein, I, I sort of think of this in a way like, like dropping a pebble into a still pond. So it's the pebble hits and then these ripples move outwards as every part of our body responds to that perturbation, which might be quite specific on the molecular level, but it's going to ripple out uh, through our body. And understanding that I consider is, is, is uh, sort of a, one of the most difficult challenges. And, and would further say that traditional healers didn't know about molecules, and they also had a very limited toolbox of treatments, mostly coming from herbs or, or other natural materials. But they did very much consider the whole body and mind of their patients, and I think for this reason, if no other, we need to be respectful of, of um, traditional treatments and, and try to learn from them. And with that spirit in mind, this, this uh, a seminar you're hearing today is a little bit, in some ways, a reprise of a seminar we had in 
2017, which Helen and I organized with a colleague from Hong Kong, which was uh, mostly focused on, on, on drugs, but where we really had talks on Western pharmacology and Eastern pharmacology and uh, efforts to bring those two together. And it was uh, a really fascinating seminar. I think it was, the, our, our collaborators on this was a, a school of traditional Chinese medicine in Hong Kong, which I think is a rather modern school of that kind. And they had quite an emphasis on understanding their traditional medicines from a fairly uh, Western perspective. But I certainly gained a lot of respect uh, and was, you know, convinced there was some interesting, like how do you do a clinical trial, a double-blinded clinical trial like we do in the West on a traditional medicine? That was uh, fascinating to, to learn about that, but um, some of these things uh, clearly work. So in my lab, we study two uh, uh, plant-derived natural products. They both happen to be from the West rather than the East, although that's a, a kind of coincidence. I'm going to talk today a little bit about culture scene, this molecule here, which is the poison of the autumn crocus. And this is very much a traditional Western medicine. It has an ancient history. It was uh, in use clearly by the ancient Greeks. Um, and um, there's uh, one uh, medical papyrus from the Middle Kingdom in Egypt, which is interpreted as, a, as this flower. And then we also, I won't talk about today, we also uh, spend quite a lot of time on a, a poison derived from the Pacific yew tree, paclitaxel, rather a famous molecule that's a very important treatment for breast cancer and other solid tumors. This one is used to treat uh, inflammatory disease. So why those uh, particular medicines? The answer is they both impinge on a molecule I've been studying ever since my uh, PhD, uh, the, the microtubule, which is a, a long thread-like polymer that runs through our cells and provides structural organization and transport. And in my PhD, I studied how these microtubules are built by a tubule in adding at the end, and the microtubule gets longer, or it, they can come off, and the microtubule gets shorter. And I, I could give you a, a whole lecture on microtubules, and I won't, but let me just tell you they're very important when cells divide. The chromosomes are separated by microtubules. And the neurons, which are the longest cells in our bodies, so they have very long processes. For example, motor neurons, the, the cell bodies are in your spinal cord, but the synapses are, are in muscles that could be, for example, in your toes. And it's an electrical signal that triggers muscle contraction. Uh, but uh, the axon has microtubules in it, and, and they are the railroad tracks to supply new material using motors uh, uh, down to it. Today, I, I want to talk about, well, really only one poison, but colchicine inhibits microtubules from being built. Paclitaxel inhibits them from breaking down. These are both poisons. They were evolved by these plants to become poisonous to herbivores, basically. And uh, microtubules, probably one reason that plants evolve microtubule poisons is microtubules are pretty similar in really all animals. And so if you're poisonous to humans, you're also going to be poisonous to insects. Their microtubules are, are pretty similar. And, and the actual biochemistry here is fairly easy to block with small molecules. So these molecules evolved to be poisonous, and then it was found that in, in lower doses, in non-toxic doses, they can be useful medicines. For culture scene, that knowledge was discovered long, long ago, and there's a, a wonderful and colorful history. Paclitaxel was discovered in the 1970s uh, by the National Cancer Institute as a part of a screening program. And, I've heard some hints that there was, this is from the Pacific U, that the, the uh, native peoples might have uh, used it as a medicine. I've tried to track that down multiple times and not found any written literature, but if anybody knows any traditional uses of, of the Pacific U, I'd be uh, delighted to hear from them. Um, so here's uh, me in a field of culture scene flowers outside Vienna. It grows wild all around the Mediterranean as far north as, uh, as Vienna. This is the molecule that's extracted for it. In ancient times, it was the bulb of the culture scene plant that was ground up and used very cautiously as a medicine. It was probably also used as a poison in ancient times as well. Nowadays, uh, a culture scene is produced commercially, extracted, um, and, um, and you take it in a pill form. Uh, the pills are about half a milligram, um, and there's a... <laughs> They cost far too much in America. They should cost a penny a pill. They actually cost $10 for a, a legal snafu that I won't uh, spend time talking about. But um, they sh I, in this seminar, it's, I shouldn't be showing a picture of myself. I should be showing a picture of Rachel Wang, a postdoc who actually noticed in the audience. 
Uh, Rachel is a very brave, she's an absolute fearless experimentalist, and she was willing to tackle a really wacky theory I'm going to tell you about. And she's become the expert on inflammation uh, and culture scene in, in my group. She's the only person uh, working on this. So what I'm telling you is uh, 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 several years of her life, and I really appreciate uh, her dedication. And we needed to be a, a big splash. Sorry, I'm, I'm rattling on too much. My time's timing out. So culture scene is mostly used to treat gout. So if you eat rich food, it's broken down into uric acid. That's supposed to be excreted. As we get older in some people, the excess uric acid precipitates in the joints. The crystals don't cause any problem. The problem is when white blood cells eat them, and that damages the white blood cells, and they secrete a damage signal, particularly IL-1 beta, that causes the pain and swelling. And uh, 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 Helen mentioned uh, uh, inflammation already, and it's this process where white blood cells sense tissue damage. They leave. Uh, uh, the blood, and then they start making more of, of, of these tissue damage signals, so there tends to be positive feedback. And culture scene in some way blocks that. But the question is, what's that? how does that relate to its molecular action? The textbook model, and if any of you are in medical school, this is the right answer on board, so, so you should remember this, and what I'm going to tell you is a different answer, is that the culture scene gets directly into the white blood cells, damages their microtubules, and stops them sticking. It's the obvious model, but it has a number of problems. I won't uh, elaborate. Rayshar and I don't believe this model, uh, but what are the alternatives? Um, and um, I can ask you guys a very quick question here. Colchicine is a plant-derived toxin that gets into our blood. It's absorbed uh, from a meal, from eating it, and gets into the blood. Do you guys know which uh, organ in our blood is most responsible for detoxifying a foreign uh, a chemical in our blood? Anyone? Liver, very good, you guys, exactly. Much faster than my PhD class, may I say. <laughs> yes, so the liver. So is it possible that colchicine actually acts on the liver? This is an outrageous suggestion because uh, it doesn't affect the liver. There are no liver side effects of colchicine. It affects white blood cells and, and possibly the endothelium and blocks inflammation. Uh, but uh, Raisha and I, uh, this, these are all her experiments. She started doing some experiments of uh, uh, feeding colchicine to mice. Actually, we inject it into mice. It's more reliable. Dissect tissues. And I'm going to show you an experiment where we measure a marker of cellular stress. And um, it doesn't really matter. We're looking at an SDS shell. This is actually a Western blot. This here is a marker of cellular stress. This is uh, a, a marker that, that she loaded the right amount of protein each gel. But I, just looking at that, here are four tissues labeled here. Can you, can you guys see which tissue the culture scene is acting on? Liver, yes. Yeah, well, that, that was a ringer, right? But we really see no action anywhere in the mouse except in the liver. Now, this marker of the relationship to this to the medicine is not clear. But basically, our model is that culture scene gets into the liver, and really only the liver, causes the liver to secrete some factor, I'll call factor X, that acts on white blood cells. And that's not a totally outrageous suggestion because the liver makes almost all the proteins in our blood and so that it makes one more protein that affects white blood cells I think is, is, is not unreasonable. And Resha has identified a candidate for this that since she hasn't published and I'm not going to uh, talk about today, but we have a specific molecule here in mind. And um, I'll just end by saying, if this is true for one traditional medicine, and it, it, this is a fairly wild assertion that we haven't published yet, I think it could be true for others. In general, the liver exists, I mean, it evolved in part, uh, the biochemistry to detoxify plant-derived toxins so we could survive in the wild. And when people are developing Western drugs, one of the main things they have to fight is the tendency of the liver to inactivate those drugs. So I think it's an interesting speculation that some of these wonderful uh, traditional Chinese medicines that are always given as mixtures actually also act not directly on the whole body, but indirectly through the liver. And this may seem a little Galenist or something. Was a, Galen was a, a, an ancient Roman doctor who believed in the humors and things. But, but the liver is really, it's the largest organ in our body. It makes most of the proteins in blood. and it picks up essentially any small molecule uh, uh, toxin and, and acts on it. So I think this uh, outrageous model here should be considered more widely and just thank my group, but particularly Ray Shah, who's there uh, hiking in New Hampshire. Thank you. <clears throat>
<clears throat> okay. I think I went into orange but not red, so uh, Peter, the, the, the podium is yours. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here, it's exciting. So building on this theme of reaching into the East to look for new therapies for our medicine, I think one of the more promising and popular therapies that, that we're looking to the East for um, is what we call Tai Chi and mind-body practices. And this is also one of the main areas of focus in my laboratory. So what I wanted to do today in the next 15, 20 minutes is show how this traditional exercise that's designed as a mind-body exercise to touch both the mind and the body, to sort of connect these systems, is promising for a lot of issues that are facing our society today, especially our aging population, namely related to balance and cognition. I think you talked about neurogenic diseases. Um, but more broadly, uh, not only looking at these, but how this mind-body ecological approach to health is starting to shift how we think of the body as a more holistic system-oriented perspective, like Dr. Langevin and Dr. Um, uh, Mitchison has already introduced. I need to disclose that in addition to being a researcher of Tai Chi, I teach Tai Chi in the community, but that the Brigham um, and I keep a strong firewall between keeping my science away from my practice and my practice away from my science. So I think everyone here knows that falls and dementia are really a huge part um, and, a, and a pressing issue in our aging society. Um, when you look at the statistics, it's really alarming and staggering. I think many of you know that about one third of older adults over the age of 65 fall each year. And those falls um, have huge impacts um, on their health and, um, and the health of, of, of um, the whole community as a society as a whole. One out of five people who fall and have a fracture die that year, um, not because of the fracture itself, but because of what we call the sequelae, the side effects, the changes in lifestyle, the inability to go out and, and socialize and things like that. And obviously this has huge impacts on the individuals, their families, but also societal costs. Um, it's estimated that uh, by 2020, um, falls will cost society close to $55 billion, right? And there's no pill to take to stop you from falling, right? The statistics for um, dementia are even more alarming, and you hear a lot of this on the news. Um, about five and a half million people have what's called mild cognitive impairment, an early stage of dementia before Alzheimer's um, and other degenerative diseases. Um, and another three and a half million have full-blown dementia. And these costs are staggering. Um, they're about $150 billion in 2010. And because our society is aging rapidly, the, the numbers are escalating. And the traditional approaches to dealing with both balance and cognition, as Helene showed in her model, um, there are different departments and they focus on different things and they're not highly integrated. So if you have balance issues, traditionally you go to a gerontologist or a physical therapist, they'll say, let's work on your physical strength. Um, let's strengthen your legs, create a little bit of flexibility, a little bit of agility, maybe some um, aerobics so you have more stamina, right? And at the other end, if you have mental issues, uh, mental problems and beginning of some cognitive things, let's do some cognitive training. Um, maybe start doing Sudoku puzzles, crosswords, new, learn a new language, a lot of social activities, maybe even some behavioral therapy. Um, and again, there's not many good um, medicines available for arresting dementia. But what we're learning in systems thinking is that things even as simple as walking and balancing require things from the bottom up and the top down. And I'm just gonna say a few things about that. There's a really rich literature, has nothing to do with Tai Chi, but people are really starting to know that how you move predicts whether or not you're gonna have dementia in the future. So for example, there are studies that show when you come in um, to a study, a big epidemiological study, if you walk slowly or your gait is slightly impaired, even if you control for your current cognitive function, 
your diet, whether you smoke or not, it predicts how you move, whether or not you're more or less likely to have dementia in the future. What's also true is the converse, which is that how you think affects whether or not you're going to fall. Right? And that makes sense in some ways, and I'll show you lots of data that we use in our laboratory. But if I asked you all to stand on one leg, you could do pretty good. But if I asked you to stand on one leg and count backwards by six and a halfs, all of a sudden, because your attention is not focused on your balance and it's distracted, that impacts things. And we know that these top-down processes, what we call executive function and other higher order functions, impact how we move. So this more ecological approach where the mind affects the body and the body affects the mind is making us wonder, how do we prescribe exercise and activities for our aging population? Maybe if we're interested in these sorts of interactions, we should be teaching people how to do Sudoku puzzles while they're on a treadmill, right? And actually, there's quite a bit of research, um, some research what's called dual tasking interventions, where you do practice balance while you're doing some cognitive skills, mathematical things, memory games. And there's even high-tech approaches where they use virtual reality so you can practice walking on a treadmill, but while you're wearing glasses, there may be obstacles that you have to come. So you have to start to plan and react, and you're using the top down and the bottom up at the same time. So that's a very modern approach, and there's a lot of promise there. But there's also some what we would call old school approaches, and that's where some of the things in one of the topics in my lab. And one of the interventions we focus a lot on is called Tai Chi. Um, so just a quick definition, just by show of hands, how many here have experienced something like Tai Chi or Qigong or? Oh, good. Good, good. We're actually going to do a little exercise together, so you, you'll all have left of learning just a little bit of Tai Chi. But um, just to create some context, uh, as you all know, Tai Chi is what we call a mind-body exercise. It has roots in Asian um, medicine, um, as well as philosophy and martial arts. And it integrates slow, intentional movements. Maybe you've seen people do this in the park with breathing, and importantly for this mind-body work, multiple cognitive skills. You're focusing intently on your body, um, heightened body awareness, where your limbs are, and you also use mental skills like imagination, like flow like river or, um, or be rooted like a tree. Those thoughts affect our physical body, and we're going to experience some of that in a few moments. And the goals of Tai Chi are to strengthen, relax, and integrate, to, to make more whole the physical body, the mind, and through that, improve health, personal awareness and development. And on some levels, Tai Chi is a martial art, so you get to protect yourself. So are you all willing to do a little bit of what we call hand Tai Chi? I think the, the purpose here is we could talk about this stuff, but if you have just even a two-minute experience, then I think you'll appreciate this research and its potential a little bit more, okay? So what you need to do is just put some things down so you have your hands free, and in particular, one hand, but um, it's nice to just start and compare your hands. So we're going to do what's called an N of 1 experiment. You're the, you're the subject, and we're going to do an experiment together. And just rest your hands comfortably and just notice them. It's not something people ask you to do, but just notice the sensations, okay? And then put one of them to rest, and with the other hand, maybe it's your index finger, I want you to just wiggle it around and just play with your finger, okay? One of the things you'll notice is the second you start moving something, you can feel it more. So it brings your attention there, right? Now I want you to just slow it down a little bit and just begin to stretch all the tissues in your fingers all the way out to the end knuckle and then relax it deeply. And if you can remember some of Dr. Longevin's slides, every knuckle and muscle is wrapped in this elastic connective tissue. So you're just drawing on these little bungee cords and stretching them all the way, not to the point where you feel strain or fear, but just to tune in a little bit. And then you relax that. And each time you do this for about three or six more times, I want you to see if you can notice another part of your knuckle you haven't noticed. Uh, maybe a top part or a bottom part or distal part near your fingernail or near the base of the finger. But you're moving to start to notice more, to bring a little bit more awareness of your own body. Right? Remember Dr. Longevin said that all of these tissues are in this big soup. Right, that's floating around with really nourishing chemicals that rehydrate your tissues and 
wash out inflammation. So maybe you can notice how juicy your finger is as you stretch it and release it. And see if you can just spread this juice a little bit more freely into every nook and cranny. And there's no rush. You don't get more points for doing a lot of these. So rest in between. And then when you feel like doing another stretch, you can do it. Now, what if you coordinated this with your breathing? So now you just sort of breathe in a little bit as you stretch. And you breathe out as you relax. And you do that a few times. Then you add all your other fingers. And you've got all five of these working together. And I know that everyone at the medical school and the communities are really interested in eliminating health disparities. So you can ask which of your fingers is a little underserved right now, and can you stretch that just a little bit and include every knuckle that you care about, right? So there's a little bit of kindness of giving back to your hand. And then here's the last piece, because this is a big part of the research here at the med school, placebo or imagination. So imagine in the heart of your palm, you can just put a couple drops of the fountain of youth and all your ailments, all your aches and pains go away and you just sort of stretch and magically your hand starts to feel a little bit more tingly, more relaxed, more juicy. Okay, now I just want you to rest that hand and compare it to your other hand. Any differences you can notice? I see some nodding. Some people more tingly, a little warmer, more sensation, more life there. Okay. What you can imagine that Tai Chi is doing is just the same thing with the whole body. You're stretching all the tissues. It's like a dynamic yoga. And what just happened there and what happens in a typical Tai Chi class is quite complex. You could think of Tai Chi as a multi-drug intervention. We moved our physical body, right? There's stretching, there's strengthening. When we're doing it standing up, it's weight bearing. So here, um, we've got this thing that looks like typical exercise, aerobics and strengthening. But we're not just interested in the pieces, but how they all fit together, the coordination of things. So structural integration and dynamic integration. We're doing a lot of mind-body work. It's like dynamic meditation, focus, attention, mindfulness. And imagery, I asked you to imagine this juicy ocean and imagine something. And we know from very good research that what we believe greatly affects our physiology, whether it's in placebo or in meditation. Um, breathing, um, typically Tai Chi is done in groups and we know that being part of a group is quite therapeutic. Um, and I'm saying sometimes in the teachings, um, do a little less. There's a philosophy to it. Go with the flow. And so all of these together are components that we've studied separately in medicine. But when we put the package together, it's a much more ecological approach. And we bring that into this complex system that affects the mind and the body. And this is just an example. Um, it's a little busy. I'll just... I'll to say a few things about it. But we know that Tai Chi is one of the better exercises. The Cochrane Collaborative reports on um, what's the state of knowledge in, in different fields. And in terms of balance, Tai Chi is one of the best exercises out there. And on average for older people, it reduces the risks of falls by about 30%. And that's pretty good. And the question is, why and how? And it's not the same as a single drug hitting a certain molecule, but it's a little bit more like Dr. Mitchison was saying, it's this ripple effect, but you're hitting with lots of stones that are rippling all together at the same time. The whole system is moving. And here are some of the things that change that pre prevent falls. We get stronger uh, muscles, the sensation in your fingers and the soles of your feet that help you balance get better. Um, there's better reaction time because the neuromuscular system is working better. And I'm going to say some more things about these mind-body pieces, the fear of falling and what that does to the body and the paying attention. Um, very good research um, done in the Boston area on pain for osteoarthritis of the knee, um, some neck pain and back pain studies as well. Okay, so you get the idea. This is a very different approach to the first model that Dr. Langevin talked about where we separate everything, we treat pieces. Here we have a complex intervention going into the whole system and shifting it, okay? So one of the areas where mind and body come together is in fear of falling. And anyone who has an elder friend or a colleague or if God forbid you fall on yourself, you know there's a, 
what we call a phenotype, a shape to falling. You literally get scared stiff. You start walking in a more stiff way, you hold your breath, you're anxious, and ironically, that braced, distracted um, behavior makes it much less likely that you're gonna go out to do exercise, which makes it much more likely for you to be deconditioned, which makes it much more likely you're gonna fall, and it's this vicious cycle. Um, and it's hard to break this cycle. Okay. And one of the areas that Tai Chi has been shown to be really helpful for is to alleviate this fear or anxiety of falling, right? And we know, ironically, one of the biggest predictors of falling is fear of falling. So we've got to break that cycle. So there's very good research to show from multiple large-scale clinical trials that Tai Chi reduces this anxiety um, and that that change in anxiety is contributing to the reduction in fall rate. And then more generally, because it's this gradual approach of feeling your body and not giving it 120%, but just going to the place where you feel comfortable, we're starting, it, it, it makes people who are deconditioned with health issues more comfortable easing back into exercise. So we're starting to call it a gateway exercise. It's a nice transition. Okay. Another area that we're very interested in is this idea I mentioned before about paying attention and affecting your balance. And we know that there's what we call a cost to thinking or arguing with your spouse or friend while you're walking. So this is some... Um, just showing um, different types of distractions. So there's no distraction here. This is asking someone to like, tell me all the vegetables that begin with the letter P. It's called phenomes. This is someone counting backwards by threes and by sevens. And you can see as the task gets more complicated, they walk slower. So there's a cost to thinking while you're moving. This is the same tasks, but it's not just speed. It's what we call variability. So someone who walks very regularly has a nice rhythm. Someone who walks irregularly has um, a high variability in the timing of the steps. An extreme version of that would be what we call freezing of gait and Parkinson's, where people just get stuck and they need to break out of that cycle. So thinking can affect the speed and rate. And the question that we ask is this. Um, this is a woman walking in our laboratory, um, same person. You can see that at the top, she's without a dual task. She's counting backwards by sevens. And on the bottom, she has a dual task. She's count, uh, counting. Um, at the top, she's not counting. At the bottom, she is. You can see without the task, she walks both faster, right? But also look at the placement of the steps and the regularity in the top and the bottom. And what we want to know in our research is if she studies Tai Chi for three or six months or a year, while she's counting, can her steps look more like this? Right? So that, you get that? Okay. And the short answer is um, yes. This is um, walking speed improvements following Tai Chi after just 12 weeks. These are not spring chickens. Um, this is a group of, of people whose average age is 85 years old when they're starting to learn Tai Chi. And um, more than 20 of the participants are over 90 years old. Okay. And what we see is that short-term Tai Chi training improves speed, and these are the people who were not doing Tai Chi. When we shift them to the other group, they catch up. Okay. And we see a similar thing with respect to the variability. And this is an important marker because this is now in very healthy adults um, that are slightly younger, 50 to 80, and this is highly predictive of falls. And what we can see is that um, the Tai Chi people who've been practicing for a while have lower variability, which, in, as I mentioned, is better. We can also bring them into the laboratory, and all of this stuff, what's nice is we're using these objective measures of science to look at these traditional measures. So we can bring them into the laboratory and say, what does their balance look like with very precise measurements? There's image uh, cameras all around. Each of those dots is an infrared sensor, so we can create a robot. And this is someone just doing a simple Tai Chi movement. But this arrow here shows you where their center of pressure is, how much they wobble basically, over the base of support in their feet. And what we can do is we can say, OK, here's a person who we ask to stand still, and this is how much they wobble front to back and left to right. right? This is how much they wobble while they're counting. So you can see that they wobble a lot more when they're distracted. And the difference between those areas, the blue and the red area, is what we call the cost of being distracted. And we want to know if Tai Chi uh, reduces that cost. It improves the cognitive motor interactions. And yes, 
the short answer is this is some work uh, done in our group. And for many measures of these wobbles, whether it's the speed of wobbling or the overall area, um, Tai Chi reduces that cost. The last thing I want to say is we've been very interested in looking at cognition itself. Um, and we've done, we're doing some empirical work, but we've also reviewed the literature. And we know that exercise is very good for preserving and sometimes reversing loss of mental function. All right, um, and we were interested in whether the slow Tai Chi movement and the multi-component attention and breathing and relaxation would do it. And the short answer is um, there seems to be promising evidence in that area and people are starting to do brain imaging to show that not only do the behavioral changes that we see um, uh, look robust, but there's actually literally plastic changes in the function of the brain that we can measure in MRI scanners. So just to conclude and pull this together, uh, I think it's fair to say that Tai Chi is a promising intervention to continue looking at uh, for preserving and enhancing a number of domains of health, especially in the aging population. And cognition and balance are two of them. Um, the multi-component nature of mind-body training and how it, it's been designed to sort of get into the system and connect the pieces in a more holistic way, I think makes it very different than unimodal drug therapies or even unimodal physical therapies that work on individual parts of the body. Um, and I think this ecological approach um, makes it a useful tool, much like Dr. Uh, Mitchison's and, and Langevin's approaches, to reach to the East and to use these not just as therapies, but as tools to probe the fundamental nature of the human body and its health and balance. So um, my lab uh, is very collaborative, and I'm a small part of a lot of my research, so lots of people to thank that I don't have time for, including the National Institutes of Health for their support, but especially to you guys for listening. So we're going to be now uh, taking some questions, and you've been uh, kind enough to put them down on your on these index cards. So I'm going to be uh, directing for the first question to Dr. Wayne. How are the benefits of Tai Chi similar or different to yoga? That's a great question. Um, as you, if you remember the diagram that shows all the multiple components many of those ingredients or components are common to yoga. Um, there's stretching, there's mindfulness, there's breathing, there's relaxation, there's imagery. So I think there are more parallels and commonalities and differences. There have been almost no studies, actually, that I'm aware of, maybe one uh, small one, that have literally put them back to back. It's a tough question, because even within yoga and tai chi, you have a lot of variability. You've got vinyasa flow yoga and kundalini yoga, and pranayama yoga, and then you have different styles of tai chi. I think at the core, they share many more similarities and differences. And I think the main difference to me is that tai chi evolved as a martial art. And so you're up on your feet, and it's very functional. And I think it translates to pushing car doors open and lifting boxes. Um, and there are no downward dog poses, for example. Um, so I think there's some advantages to both. But I think the tai chi translates a little bit more closely to me to activities of daily living. Great. Thank you. For Dr. Midges. By targets, do you refer to the general areas that are affected by the disease or the components of the disease that are causing problems in the first place? And this is by a high school sophomore. That's a very... Uh... <laughs> Good question. So I was talking about targets mostly in the context of uh, drug discovery. Um, I think when professional <clears throat> drug discoverers use the word target, 
they're usually referring to a molecule. Um, uh, for example, um, right now in, for cancer treatment, we're very excited about turning on the immune system, and we've learned how to turn on uh, uh, T cells by uh, uh, targeting a couple of molecules. One's called PD-1 and PD-1 ligand. So PD-1 is, is just the name of a, a molecule on the outside of a cell. So the word target is, is usually used to mean a specific molecule. And a huge thrust in academic research has been how do you take something as complex as a human disease that affects many parts of your body and boil it down to one target, which if you hit that target, and that's literally the words people use, it will help. And that's the, the art and the challenge of drug discovery. But it's usually used to mean a particular molecule that has some causal relationship to the disease. OK, this one's for me. Does reduced inflammation occur in all parts of the body or the area local to the stretched connective tissue? That's a great, great question. question. I agree. And we don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> but we are actually designing some experiments right now to, to um, test that. And one of the reasons we think this is really important, say you have a part of your body that has some inflammation in it. Say you have tendonitis or something like that. That part of the body may be painful, right, to stretch. What if you could improve that area by stretching the other side? Wouldn't that be nice? We think it's actually important to stretch the area that's actually inflamed for a variety of reasons, but it needs to be done very gently. And gentle is key. And pain should be a signal to not stretch beyond the point where it hurts. But this is a very, very good question. What is the difference between alternative and complementary medicine? Do you want to take a stab at that? <laughs> yeah, you know, the um, terminology in this field has really evolved. It used to be alternative medicine at the NIH, um, and then the National Institutes of Health, that is, um, then formed the Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. And then in the last year or two, they've changed it to complementary and integrative medicine. And it really, it, it, it means generally that it offers an alternate approach or a complementary approach to whatever is mainstream. Um, and what has been mainstream changes over time. Um, back in the days of Galen and, and the Roman, there were people saying, well, if you're going to go over to the temples where they do dream yoga, don't come to me because my work with the four humors is the real medicine, and that's the alternative one. And, and what's mainstream and what's alternative keeps changing. And over time, as, as Helen showed, at the bottom of that set of icebergs, we're starting to realize that there's fundamental things that are common to everything. And I think this is... Um, the idea of integrative medicine, um, that really is we're taking the best of everything and we're understanding the basic biology and we're putting them um, together with a, a more systems view of health. Uh, but it's a really challenging question and everyone uses these words very differently. What led you to, the, to your interest in this field? Who's, who's that for? I think it's for you. Ah. Yes, the, the work I was talking about. It's been a long journey for me. I, when I was younger, I was interested just in how life worked, how proteins and DNA got together to build cells. So I wasn't interested in medicine. I was just interested in how cells work. And, and uh, you know, and that's a, an interest I, I kindled in, in, in childhood, actually looking, you know, peering at, at living processes. It's really in the last 10 years or so that I've gotten much more interested in medicine. Uh, part of the reason for that, actually, is our knowledge of, of how cells work, the sort of basics of life processes, has gotten much more complete. So there are many things that were totally mysterious when I was a kid that, that now we have some sense of how they work. And so like a lot of basic scientists, which is still what I am, now feels like the time to start applying that knowledge. 
Um, so, so that's sort of, that's part of my evolution. And I think a, a lot of basics, I think at Harvard Medical School, I, I work on the quad that's just across the street here, you may, may see on your way in or out. I think the quad has long been a hotbed of, of what people call fundamental research, but more and more of us are realizing, you know, we've actually made some progress on those problems. Hey, it's time to, to you know, look up and, and, and see, you know, people and, and real medicine. I think we should all answer this question. Yes. <laughs> you go next. I'm next. But I already gave you part of my answer uh, in what I was talking about this grabbing thing. I used to be uh, an internist. I, I used to practice internal medicine. And a lot of my patients had chronic pain. Even though I was an internist, I was not a pain specialist, but still, you will ask any doctor, uh, in any specialty, they will say, treating chronic pain is the most frustrating and difficult thing. And at the time, this was back in the 1980s, there was really very little in terms of alternatives to uh, you know, pharmacological treatments. And so there happened to be an acupuncture school in the town next to where I was practicing. And so I went and, and, uh, and they taught me how to manipulate the needles. And then I realized I was feeling something as I was manipulating them. And there was no good explanation for this. And I told you the rest. <laughs> so like Dr. Mitchison, I grew up being a science geek. I love science. And um, I was also very interested in environmental issues. So I pursued a degree in um, evolutionary biology. I actually did my PhD here at Harvard. And I was very interested in ecosystems and climate change and plants. Um, but at the same time, starting when I was 15 years old uh, in high school, I started doing Tai Chi and martial arts. And I was teaching in the Boston area. And somehow these worlds started to interact with each other. I was very interested in this ecological view of health. And I was looking at what conventional medicine was offering and thinking, there's some, some views here that are missing. And I was still interested in my science. So I took my perspectives of nature and how things are all interconnected and how to design experiments and how to quantify interactions and just left the world of plants and forests and applied it to animals, uh, to humans and medicine. And that, well, animals, I guess. And that's, that's been about 20 years since I've made that shift. Um, but I think they go well together. Um, do you feel that integrative medicine is being more accepted in the West, or do you find people may be reluctant? So, maybe I should take that. Yes, that's, you're, the, you're the expert. <laughs> so, I would say definitely there is a lot of uh, progress in the understanding and, and the curiosity and the willingness to embrace uh, healing traditions that, number one, are not conventional, and number two, where we may not know all the answers. Uh, a lot, uh, Dr. Wayne talked about the placebo effect. And this is something that is a very important part of all types of treatment, right? doesn't matter if you give somebody a pill, or if you do massage to them, or if you uh, do um, any type of a surgery even. There is a component of that treatment that has to do with the sort of what we call nonspecific effects that, that happen regardless of the, the, the fact that person is put in a healing environment. Something, somebody is doing something to them. Somebody's being kind to them. Somebody's listening to them. Somebody's, and so all of these things, it turns out that once we started studying like alternative medicine, and then we would compare them to like, for example, do acupuncture, real acupuncture compared with placebo acupuncture. And there was not a whole lot of difference between what we, you do fake acupuncture by inserting, pretending to insert the needles, and really insert the needles. And people would say, oh, it's just placebo. Well turns out that the placebo response is really an important healing response. Imagine if you are able to incorporate something that happens to you during some kind of you know, therapy and heal yourself. That's really important. So we're starting to understand how the, the healing aspect of some of these treatments 
may or may not be, um, you know, we don't understand all the mechanisms behind it, but it really has enlarged our understanding of what a therapy is. Yeah. So I think that there is, there's a long way to go, but we've certainly uh, expanded our understanding of, of the variety of different options that are available to patients, especially for pain. Yeah. Because right now we're stuck with pain, uh, with, with pain treatments. Yeah. Uh, we really have this problem now with, with addiction, addictive drugs, especially the opiates, and people are really looking at non-pharmacological or less addictive drugs. So this is an opportunity. I mean, a lot of, a lot of medicine is starting to embrace that as a great opportunity to learn more and to offer different options to patients. Yeah. And can I add to that? Yeah. Um, it, we've really come a long way, and we have a long way to go, not just for what we call alternative or integrative medicine, but cancer biology is still, in many ways, at its infancy. It's interesting. Um, I think at this point, there's probably about 16 hospitals associated with Harvard. I think about more than 12 or 13 or 14 of them offer acupuncture. They offer it in, a, in the cancer wards because there's good scientific evidence to show that it's a nice adjunct to chemotherapy to manage nausea and, um, and side effects of, of treatment, and also in pain clinics. Um, and there's good research. Uh, far from comprehensive research, and we don't exactly know why it works in some cases, but there's good research, especially for pain and cancer. In the case of Tai Chi, um, my colleagues here are often surprised to know that there's close to 2,000 peer review articles on Tai Chi. And I think it's this research, and research done carefully, and research done in settings like the Harvard Medical School, that's just opening up these conversations. Um, and I think that's a really important. And I think, as scientists, we want to be very careful about not overstating what we know, um, but at the same time saying there's something here that's worth looking at. And so I think that's, that's creating a big shift. Yeah. And I want to just add, if, like, say, for example, we end up finding that, you know, I was talking about these acupuncture points and meridians, if there really is no difference between putting a needle at an acupuncture point or a not acupuncture point, we need to understand that and we need to say, well, maybe that's not important. But the ac there's other things about the acupuncture treatment that may be important, and we need to really start, start pulling this apart so that people, so that we can refine and understand what is the ingredient of these treatments that actually is, is what matters. Um, and, and so the more science we do, the more we can answer these questions, I think the more accepted um, it is going to be. Did you have anything you wanted? It's, uh, it's very interesting visiting China and talking to people who have a foot in both worlds about, about their attitude to, for example, tr traditional Chinese medicine in China is, is a, it's a whole parallel health system. They have hospitals, they have universities. But uh, they're also very accepting of Western medicines. For example, no one tries to treat infectious disease with traditional Chinese medicine. They go straight to Western antibiotics. So there's a, I've noted, a traditional sort of high level from a good university, traditional Chinese practitioner in China has to learn a lot of Western medicine. Essentially, all of them use both in parallel. And the people I talked to, you know, they were very honest with me. There's some things we feel we can treat better other ways and other, other things, you know, we absolutely go for Western medicine. Infectious disease was just one. And so I think it's, it is very interesting seeing that system China's become quite a modern country, but uh, traditional Chinese medicine as an academic discipline, as a medical practice, isn't going anywhere. It's still very popular. And so, you know, maybe, I, I, you know, I don't quite see uh, America going there, but it's, it's an interesting to, to see that side of it. How can one find out if their doctor is open to integrative medicine? What should they ask? I can say something about that because at the Osher Clinic, uh, one of the things that, one of the studies I've led is to ask 1,700 consecutive patients about their attitudes about integrative medicine. And one of the questions is, do you disclose this, your use of integrative medicine um, with your doctor? And I think uh, Dr. Mitchison said, it's important if you're doing these things to disclose them because it's important to combine it in a very safe way. One of the reasons the Osher Center exists is because in the early 1990s, Dr. Eisenberg, 
wrote the first article in the New England Journal of Medicine saying that many, many millions of people are using this. They're spending lots of money, um, and they're not telling their doctors about it. And they were afraid about that. Um, I think that attitude is changing. I think um, people are more comfortable talking about it. I think physicians are being trained in med school to ask proactively um, and maybe with less judgment. And also, as the Osher Center here at Brigham Women's Hospital, these clinics are embedded within conventional care hospital where the acupuncturist writes notes so that the neurologist can read them. So I think we're starting to break down those barriers. But I think it's important to share that. Um, and I think the question of finding the right doctor is a complicated one. You have to find one that you feel comfortable with, that you trust, um, but that you can be honest with. I, I do want to reiterate with herbal medicine that if it's something you're, you're eating, I do think it's important to share with your doctor because, because of the risk of drug-drug interactions. And uh, I mean, if your doctor may not be trained to deal with that, hopefully he can refer you to someone who can. Part of the training now of medical students is when we say we're taking the history uh, from the patient is to ask about these things. And this is a new, the new generation of doctors who are growing up with this as from the time that they're in medical school, it's going to become second nature. It's not, it, 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 when that study uh, that, that Dr. Wayne mentioned is that it's so just a few years ago. There was a survey that really demonstrated that doctors generally do not ask. That's one of the main reasons patients don't talk about it. Yeah. But it's, that's starting to change. Reg, a, reg, a, a, um, a related question. What regulatory hurdles do doctors, but I'm, I think it goes beyond doctors, face when wanting to incorporate these types into their practice? And I know from a pharmacology uh, point of view, the regulations are, are quite important. Yes, I mean, uh, Western medicines are regulated by, by the FDA, and, and there is quite an industry in America of, of, of rather active substances being sold uh, uh, on the internet that you know, probably should be, but if they're sold as a nutraceutical or something, uh, they may escape FDA regulation. I think people really should be careful with that, in, in, in my opinion. There's also, uh, just, we learned at the conference last year, there's a, a fascinating issue of how do you really test if a traditional medicine actually works by a, a Western criteria of a double-blind clinical trial, and ra rather little of that ha has been done, but is happening much more in, 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 in China. But um, I, yeah, I'm not an expert on, 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 on regulatory science, but I... I mean, I, I am a huge believer in, uh, in the FDA regulation of medicines. I, I personally have seen a lot of evidence that the FDA tries to walk a line of being, you know, allowing as many new treatments as possible while protecting patients. If they have that double mandate. I think it's, it's very difficult. They're under huge pressure from pharmaceutical companies to approve things. I mean, something that hasn't been mentioned today is the, the money aspect of medicine. I mean, I, in, in teaching pharmacology, you know, one of the things I find most troubling is, is the, the cost of medicines and what's going on there, which, which has, you know, become a huge issue, and that's, that's related to, to regulation. I mean, these, these are, you know, complicated issues that I, I I'm just a biochemist, right? I, I, with my students, when they ask about regulation or money, I, I usually say, well, I could take off my professor hat and, and answer as a citizen, but, you know, as a professor, I'm sort of, my expertise is restricted to the molecular, so. Well, I think we've come to the end of, our, of yep. our session. So thank you all for your good questions. I have so, one question from uh, Michelle, who uh, we, we didn't want to read out. If, I don't know if she's still around, but I would be happy to.